So hello. So I'm Patrick Burton. I work with TiVo. Uh, TiVo do a lot of different things. We're in the, the set-top box world. We're in the metadata world. But we have a, a group called Personalized Content Discovery, and I look after that group within Europe. And, and there's a few different things that we do. We do search and recommendation. So in Europe, you may have seen us, people like ComHem. I've seen some, some of those guys here. Uh, Vodafone, so search recommendation services provided, provided by us. We also do voice, uh, I was just talking to some of the guys. So in the UK, the Sky service, if you use voice on Sky Q, that's a TiVo solution that's delivered by our team. Phenomenally successful, very interesting, and, and, and interestingly related to what we're going to talk about here as well, churn. But we also have an analytics team uh, that sits within personalized content discovery. And we've been looking at what we can learn about our customers, because with search and recommendation, with voice, and with the return path data we get from our customers, we get a lot of data. So we have a lot of data from our customers all over the world. We have our own retail box in the US that tells us a lot about what people are doing. And it's been really interesting. I've been here the last couple of days. Data has clearly been a topic that we've all been talking about. But data married with personalization. And what's the actual impact of having that data? And what can you do with it? So we, uh, we started a study where we wanted to understand specifically what was the impact of personalization on churn. So churn is obviously a, you know, an, a topic that hits everybody. Just, just kind of as a straw poll within the audience, is anybody here from the service provider community? Do any of you work for kind of typical service providers? Not one. Interesting. Okay. Does anybody sell to those service providers? One. Jesus, who are you all? Journalists? Any journalists? Any content creators, content owners? Wow. I have no idea what the rest of you are doing here, but <laughs> thanks for coming. Um, so we have all this data, and we wanted to think about, right, what is, what is the impact of personalization? What does personalization mean? And by personalization, I mean, you know, that this Netflix experience that you all, you're all familiar with, where you get content recommended to you because you watched. That's a really basic use case, OK? So you watched uh, Game of Thrones, therefore you were like Vikings. That's a classic, classic use case. But there's a lot more to it, obviously, than that. And as we've seen, I saw somebody from UView yesterday, and it was kind of confirmed by others, but Personalization is a way for service providers to maybe combat the morass of content that is available on platforms. One of the talks yesterday was, is there too much content? And that's an interesting question, because you know, how are you going to stop the content, even if it is, and there seems to be a demand for it? I think the answer is, maybe if you personalize the experience, then you get people more engaged with the content, and it's easier to surface and easier to find. So, we looked at the data, and we want to understand what's the, what's the difference between people who are not exposed to personalized recommendations versus those who are. So we have a lot of data. We took three service providers, one in the US, two in Europe, and we looked at the data across a six-month period last year, from February to July. It was around 2.5 million subscribers. And I think that was a pretty, that's a pretty broad church. And what we're doing at the moment is we're, we're expanding that beyond. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to, we wanted to do that comparison and see what the difference was. So another question for you, whoever you are out there. What do you think is the best churn prediction? What, if you think, you know, if you're looking at an audience of a service provider, what do you think they think drives churn? Time on platform, OK, excellent. Yeah, of course. That, that's, that's probably number one, right? Typically, when you talk to people, we, we'll call that viewership. So how much, how much time do they watch watching content? When you talk to people in retention businesses within service providers, that's the number one. <coughs> Worryingly, they also say um, point of contract. So if they're at the end of the contract, they have a higher churn score than if they're at the beginning of the contract. Now, I guess that's OK. But if they're going to come to the end of the contract, they're probably looking around. You're probably going to have to offer them something to keep them on your platform. And that's probably going to come at a cost. So that's, that's probably not the best predictor. So absolutely, viewership, total duration, 
that that's, you know, these are all good indicators. People who watch lots of content tend to stay loyal. The day of the week is really important. And I'll, I'll show you actually a breakdown of the importance of what day of the week. People who watch more content at the weekend are far less likely to churn than those who watch lots of content during the week. And I can show you exactly what that looks like. And I'll, I'll ask a question when we get there. It's an interesting uh, sociological question of why, why we think that's true. Time of day is really important. When do people watch content? Change in duration. So if people go from watching 220 minutes, I think it was the average we saw yesterday of content per day, which kind of blows my mind. I don't know what these people are doing. But if they suddenly go to watching 100 minutes, then that's a sign. Something's about to happen. And that, that's a key indicator. So that's good. And the type of content they watch is, is, is important. So all of that, and I, I, relevant as well, devices, where, where are they watching the content? So if they're watching content across multiple devices, again, they're probably happy because you're giving them the service they want. They want to watch it on their mobile phone on the way to work. That's good. So we then looked, and this is, this is where it gets interesting. This, we started to look, what are the other causes? So what are the other things that people do which makes them loyal? Predictions drives loyalty. So predictions, and I think we heard uh, this, this come up yesterday again. So predictions means that I sit down at 8 o'clock at night, I turn on the TV, and, some, and the recommendation for the news comes to me. Because that's what I do every weekday night at 8 o'clock. My server should know that. If it knows that, if it recommends it to me, that's good. If it recommends a three-hour movie about the mafia at 8 o'clock on a Tuesday night, I'm not going to watch that. I'm going to go to bed in a few hours. That's, that's not going to happen. So my service doesn't know me, and then I start getting a bit disloyal to the service. Predictions are by far, well, they typically are the most sticky use case that you can hit for driving loyalty. If you can predict what people want to watch, they like it. Recommendations, more general, let's recommend, it, recommend different types of content. More like this, I think you're all familiar with this concept of what, you know, what does you like this show, therefore here's another type of show. If it, if it works, then that also drives loyalty. Prefix search, and we're going to get onto search in a second. Prefix search is when you start to search using those clunky remote controls, and you go A, da, 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 Z, da, 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 that experience. Prefix search means when I type A, it should know the show that I want rather than me having to type 16 characters. So let's say, I can't think of a show that begins with A. If I type B, I should get Breaking Bad. I shouldn't get Big Bang Theory because I don't like that show. So that's, that's prefix search. And voice. Now, I'm not going to stick on voice a lot today because a lot of the services that we work with are, it's, it's still a new technology for a lot of our customers. So we work with Sky here in the UK, as I said. Across all of our services across the world, people in the US, people like Dish, Charter, our, our own solution, we see extremely low levels of churn across those services for people who use voice to search for content. I was talking a little bit earlier, just off, off, uh, off mic, prefix search, the average prefix search for a customer, how many times a month do you think somebody uses prefix search? Two. Two. I told you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were listening. That was good. Two, one, may, two at best is the average. For voice, 28. Oh, wrong. 26. Oh. 26 is the average voice queries per month. So now you've gone from search, just, just search if you think of it agnostically, gone from two per month to 26 per month. So that takes you back to the content question of how do people, is there too much content? Well, probably not. People just, they want to search for it, they want to find it. Voice allows you to do that. However, a lot of what we're going to talk about here, voice is not mature in the market yet for us to understand. If you take uh, our own domestic service in the US, we're still going through the first iteration of, of voice boxes. So I think it would be unfair to me to say that voice is you know, driving retention because those people are only six months, 12 months into their contract, and as we know, different. So 
if we can marry these two concepts together in terms of viewership engagement, we will see a reduction in churn. That's the hypothesis that we started out with. And these are effectively, these are the results. So we had in Europe service fighter, and again, these are service fighters that are taking search and recommendation functionality from TiVo today. For a non-PCD user who has not been served recommendations, there was a 27% churn rate across the first one. That's huge. Now, I'm not going to go specifics into these customers, but these are, that first one is taken from quite a volatile market where sport and the, and the, 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 the aggregation of sport is extremely important. But for those who were engaged through personalization, the churn was nine. So that's a low number, especially if you measure it across, across the board. In the US, where churn rates are, are, are actually lower, I think people, they, they tend to be more loyal to their brands. And because there's actually, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger market, where in Europe, you've got smaller markets, it's more aggressive in a single territory. So you know, there's, there's more of that. But for a PCD user, it was one. And then in EMEA, it was 11. So three times, on average, across the board, more likely to churn if they're not exposed to personalized content. And this is just looking at service providers. If you think of OTT providers, where it gets really interesting, because churn is the biggest factor for an OTT provider, right? I do this myself all the time. I will sign up for one month for a sporting event. Tour de France, I watch the Tour de France every year, and I sign up for a provider who does that for me. And I watch it on my phone, I watch it on my computer, and then I just go away. They don't see me for another 11 months. People do this all the time. So churn is, is a huge thing. And just to kind of balance things out, we also took the non-holistic PCD. This is a, 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 another customer of ours in the US. Non-holistic means personalization is not as front and center as the top three. It is there, but they choose to bury it in some other areas. But even then, there is, there is a relationship. Just set some rules in terms of how, how we built this, and then I'll go into the results. We took this data because this is customer data, so we don't get from a lot of these people, when we, certainly when we started the study, we didn't get the actual churn dates. We had to make assumptions around what churn is. So what we did is anyone who has had no views for four weeks and then never came back to the service. So basically, anyone who makes, gets a recommendation served to us hits our API. So we can track that. And then we can track if they ever come back again. We also get view data, so even if they don't hit our API, we actually know where they're going in the navigation because that data tends to come in, in one bundle. So that was, our, that was our definition of churn. PCD engagement then is basically how many times those people are served a recommendation or exposed, basically they make an API call to us. Do they watch content? Do they record a content? Do they click through? They are typically how you measure success in a, in a recommendations world. We call it conversion. Do they watch content? Do they record it? Do they click through to say, okay, what's this show about? That's typically defined, defined as success. And then viewership is, you know, the obvious, how much time per week do we look at? So if we look at this chart, what we're seeing is up the left-hand side, you've got your viewership. People, and it's a very, very simple, one, two, three, people at one are low viewership, people at three are high viewership. So people down below at one is low, that's understandable, and then as it goes up, that's fine. And then across the bottom, you've got people with PCD engagement. Now, where we want to get to and where we think the sweet point is, is the top right-hand corner where you've got that, marry of, that marriage of viewership, so you've got great content, but you've got great search capability. If you can ma marry those two in your UI, you will get to Nirvana, which is low churn score. And that's been proven out by the data. And this is, again, kind of going into, we call these use cases in terms of, you know, what, what, are, what are people looking at? But view duration, yes, it is the most important. And actually, there you go. So weekend, percentage of view duration at the weekend. People who watch content at the weekend churn less than people who watch content during the week. So the bottom one, they're almost you know, diagonally opposed. The one at the bottom, people who watch a lot of content during the week churn a lot. Why do you think that is? They're unemployed. Could be. 
Could be. That's why I said it's an interesting sociological question. The first time I said that, one of my colleagues said, because they're unemployed, I thought, Jesus, that's, that's, a, that's a reactionary response. I thought maybe <laughs> something else. But yeah, possibly. Possibly they're unemployed. Possibly it means they're watching more TV during the week, and then they get a job, or they decide, actually, I don't have the money to do this, so I'm going to do something else. Maybe it's because at the weekend there's more live sport on, potentially. People pay a premium for live sport. Typically, people who pay a premium for live sport, if it's available on that platform, they'll stick there because they like cycling, they like soccer, whatever, whatever it is they like. Any other suggestions around weekday? This is kind of the interesting one for you. Weekday versus weekend. Surely you guys should know. Yeah, yeah, very possibly. Very, I mean, they're, they're pretty high engaged. It's a pretty high percentage. So they, they like watching content, but maybe, may, maybe they just they find it in a different way. But I think the key point for us is you've got, you've got your viewership data up the top, but if you take the light blue, this is where it's got PCD, this is the bit that we take credit for. So we take credit for predictions. As I said, huge. Prefix search, not voice just yet, but prefix search today. And general recommendations. And there's more. These are just the headlines. There are more as you get down the use cases. But we can take credit for, we believe, around 21% of behaviors that drive loyalty, that avoid churn. Now, when I say we, I should be maybe not so brave. The point that we are trying to prove and we're trying to, trying to discuss here, it's not just about our solution. This is a generic hypothesis across personalization of UIs. We believe if you personalize your UIs and if you get people to the content quicker, which doesn't sound that surprising, but if you do it properly, they will churn less. And they will churn less in relationship to viewership. So people watch a lot of content, yes, they, view, they churn less, but actually people who get personalization, they will also churn less. So what do we then do with that information? Because it's, it's, it's interesting information. So now we've moved on to a point where we actually are starting to predict churners. So we look at the data, and we have all this data going back to say, okay, this is historically, this is what a profile of somebody who churned looked like. Now let's move that forward six months, and let's try and find people who we think are going to churn. So we did that. We ran a study, and we predicted 30 days in advance. We said, okay, we think these people are going to churn. And then we sat back and we watched. And we got a 75% accuracy. So we took all, all of this data, we looked at their behavior on the UI, what they were doing, we measured it against, or we compared it against what happened previously, and we were able to predict that these people were going to churn. Now the extension of that is, if you know people can churn, or people who are going to churn, or you think you know there, what do you do about it? Because the typical response, and again, when we talk to retention teams and our customers and service providers, a lot of times they say, well, we offer them something. You know, we offer them a DVD or, you know, a piece of content. Or we offer them a, a free upgrade to a sport package or to some different package. Okay, maybe that will work, but again, it costs money, right? Every time you do that, you're losing money. So what we started to look at is if we can actually change the behavior on the UI for more personalized content, and we start recommending more personalized content, then can we move that forward? So the stage we're at at the moment is starting to kick off proof of concepts with three customers, actually one from this, but two other customers as well, where we're going to set a time limit, and we're going to say, OK, we're going to start predicting who's going to churn and we're going to start changing the behaviors of the UI. We're going to make specific types of content available to specific people. We're going to boost search because we know how valuable and how important that is. We're going to boost predictive recommendations because we know how important that is. And then we're going to measure and we're going to see what, what the value is. So that's effectively the next step. And the way that looks for us today in, um, in our UI, so those of you who've, who've seen this before, we, we have a, an analytics platform which we call Insight. And everything that happens within our customers, so people who use voice, 
people who use search and recommendations, we have an analytics dashboard that talks about success, talks about failure. So where are they succeeding to find content, where are they failing, what are the paths that they are going down to find content, where are they going down rabbit holes, where are they being successful. But we've moved this now into our Insight platform where we're starting to actually have different metrics and different behaviors around, okay, this top is good, the bottom is bad, how do we change the dial for any of these? And on the left-hand side, you've got the kind of profile factor, so people who have high DVR play is a high percentage. Is that, po is that good, is that bad? People who've got high weekday, that's bad. How do we reduce churn against those guys? So this is becoming now a kind of continuous improvement process where we say to our customers, we give you the capability to drive the UI based on search and recommendation, based on voice, whatever that is, and then we'll, we'll track it and we'll measure it. But again, and I'll finish here, and I think I may be over time, but you, you, you keep me honest, Robert. The hypothesis is, that we see has been proved out, is people who are served personalized recommendations, who have a personalized experience on their UI, are three times less likely to churn than those who don't. Thanks very much. <laughs>